Bonjour, thank you to all of you. Um, I, I, will, I will go uh, around the topics of the, top of the paper and we'll have a comment which is more based on the paper itself that was distributed before. And then that would permit to enter into some of the details about the, the field work I have done, because one of the questions was on interviews, the other one was on the relation between client firms and, 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 the, and the government, and uh, client firms and, and providers. Um, the topic is technological learning. Technological learning is, uh, comes from a very simple idea that companies learn just as people, like organizations, uh, and then, when you state that, you have a lot of problems. The first of all problem you have, you have to choose between who's learning. Because an organization is a complex amount of groups. These groups are uh, of different status, nature, have different relations with their environment, have different uh, competences, and organize differently. So, what do you call organization? This has been the main topic of organizational learning. Since I have a blackboard, I'm going to use it. Okay? So one thing is organizational learning. And, and this brand is not new. It comes back to the 60s. It's very much related to what the American sociology of organization has been studying. Uh, it was very much related to the rise of the big enterprises and big corporations. So the idea was to understand the coordination between different levels inside the companies. And this kind of looping that's, coming, that's happening inside the company, where you have uh, uh, um, someone from the commercial department that's stating things that go back to the production, and then from the production to the management, and this kind of, of topics. That's not what I study, uh, but that was the dominant thing. And, and from that, the only thing I, I, I keep from, this, uh, from all this school is the idea that learning is a loop, something like that. So the, the enterprise is here. There is something that you learn, and this thing, in fact, feeds, feeds back to what you are doing. So it's a cumulative process. And that's one very, very important aspect. It happens on time. If it happens on time, it also has a drawback. You can't come back all the time. There are decisions you are taking that you can never come back when you take them. Not all decisions are like that. Some decisions are reversible. Some are not. And this path dependency, mean, meaning that you depend on on the path you are following up is putting you on track and is in economics and in economics of innovation is very important because it determines in which type of industrial sector and in which kind of activity you are going to be involved in this is very important because once you are in um, chroming of metals you won't be able to switch to plastics if you need plastics to build a motorcycle, but the only competences you know how to manage concerns iron and metal working, you're not going to go to switch from one to the other. So if the market goes to plastics, you're lost. If it goes to metal, you won. So this kind of decisions where you have to go to some place are decisions where you have no comeback, this kind of ir irreversibility of the decision. And, and and it really depends upon a lot upon what is your previous knowledge of what has been going on. Because you know that so and so, he will never do that. And I mean, he, you see the computer he has? I mean, he can't do what he does. Do you see the slides that they do? I mean, he can't do. This kind of knowledge that you acquire on practice, this kind of learning by doing, is, is, is probably what is the. Uh, piece of cake of every day. Learning by what? By doing. This go, th there was, there was at, at some point in the history of this kind of studies in the 80s, there was sort of multiplication of different types of learning. Learning by doing, learning by using, learning by interacting, learning by whatever. All these uh, proxies 
of learning is the same thing that you have a practice, it's situated in where you are, it belongs to the, to the competence, to the industry, to the markets, to where you were in which you are involved. You accumulate knowledge there, and then with this kind of knowledge, you take decisions and you follow a certain evolutionary path. Evolutionary in the sense that you're going to build on that to construct new prototypes, new ideas, new products, and so on and so forth. So one, is, one, one idea is that learning is cumulative. A second, a second kind of, of, of and I've, I've mentioned a lot of it, a second kind of uh, angle of attack of this is, is to s what, what I call technological learning. <coughs> I'm not the only one, of course, but it's not, it's not really a school of thought. I tried to do it, but it didn't work. <laughs> I tried to convert it in a school of thought. The last paper for me in this topic, which is in French, unfortunately, I published in a journal that is a journal of anthropology of knowledge. And it, and it concerns very much this process that says, OK, this thing that we call technological learning is different from organizational learning. Because what? Why? Since it's the same process. It's a cumulative process. Oh, yes, I said something else. It's, and that was not organizational learning that learned me, but field studies of technological learning. It's based in a specific company. It's based on practice. Learning by doing, doing is practice. Doing is not competences you acquire at the university and then that you apply. Learning is uh, working in a workplace and then you do it. Fantastic examples of that we had in the field studies that we did in Latin America, for example. Um, Danone, which makes yogurts, has created in the early 80s um, a very automatized uh, firm that ju takes just the milk and it gets out, you get out of the line with the yogurts, with a series of yogurts all packed up to, ready to deliver. With very, very little in human intervention. The idea was to have less contamination by people's interacting with the milk. So they do that in Strasbourg. And it's a brand new, enormous investment of an enormous company. And then they also have a branch in Mexico. Mexico, they don't drink milk. They're not used to yogurt, so it's a new market. And the only thing at that moment that Danone knows how to do is to do this kind of production. So they set up the, the, the La Jumelle, the um, <laughs> a, twin, a twin company that is really based on the same concept. No interaction, automatized, and so on and so forth. The problem for engineers, the French engineers, was to manage all the electronics and all this thing. You need to know, learn how to read, write, and have a sort of uh, commonality with the industrial uh, electronics. So they set up this thing with training some engineers, but really most of the workers in the company in Mexico don't know how to read, have never seen a yogurt in their life, don't know what's mi really milk at that time. And, and they just are there, trained, and at some point after three or four months working, the French firm has a strike, and then it breaks, and then the company, and then there's the, the drama. It never works. And the Mexican one, impeccable, no problem. Not because it didn't have any strike, because it had a strike also, but because, but because the, the, the kind of learning that took place inside that particular plant was very much a collective endeavor. And that's the third thing I want to say. It's collective. <coughs> And it's situated locally. And that we didn't ever learn about organizational learning. Organizational learning has very, very much difficulty in understanding this collective nature of learning. In fact, this class could be one, one entity if it was learning around the same process at the same time and interacting between people on the same process 
for the time being of that particular process. And then when you get out of room, you are different groups belonging to different countries, cultures, practices, whatever. This, this thing of joining in around one collective practice is something that we have also verified in other environments, not only industrial economics, but we find it also in um, anthropological studies of laboratory, la of laboratory work in scientific uh, environments, in scientific research. Uh, it, it's been demonstrated again and again by sociology of work when they go on the, on the, on the production lines. So it's, it's something that's very, I mean, it's not very new anymore. But in the 80s, when we were beginning to work with my colleagues on that, that was really an idea. So for me, technological learning is studying this kind of processes taking place in the workplace where production happens and then to try to see how much of this is important or not for the survival of the company. And is there any macroeconomic consequence to that? Where does innovation come into the, into the equation? Innovation comes because all the discourse we had on innovation until the 70s was something like magic. And this same discourse was this discourse on China when it began its industrialization. It just happens. Innovation just happens. Why? Because we all want to have new things. It's not true. We do not want to have new things. A good organization needs to have old things that work, routines that function. You don't need to have new things. New things is disruptive, is completely annoying, uh, and then it introduces new agents and new actors into the process. All these people are very, very, very disagreeable because they upset your organization. Then the first thing you try to do when you have novelty, you try to resist to it. And the problem is that you are interacting with markets, which markets don't really care about you. So if you don't interact with these markets, you just simply will get drift away from what is a tendency or what could be opportunities to you because you just lose contact because your organization, as an organization, does not want to have the new things that appear on the market. So the question is, how do you interact with this market? The question of innovation is this one. You have an organization, it works. You have a company, it works. It works along these principles that I just mentioned. How does it interact with novelty that appears suddenly on the market from somewhere else? Or how does it generate itself, this novelty? And it's not a very old topic in terms of social science research. Because if when we did some sort of uh, literature review, you come back to the 1976, 77, uh, as, as, uh, sorry, 66, 67 as the first studies that really are systematic on that. And that's in it, it's at the end of the 70s, mainly around the, the group that was at the SPRU at the, in England in the Science Policy Research Unit in Brighton, in England, that you had really people working on systematically reviewing what are the social and economic conditions of appearance of innovation. Uh, innovation for the American uh, economics and sociology was a matter of statistics, trying to find the determinants in a model. For example, Zvi Grealish's was trying to do tendencies to try to see if we put much money on this or that industry, how much of that pours into new products, new engine engineers, new, new, mach new machines, new things like that. This kind of things uh, were, were, in fact, were not very helpful to decision makers. That's why, wow, we have uh, my colleague, Zhao Wei, who's going to come. So he's going to speak about China, not me. Please. <laughs> well, I'll stay here. Yeah, you can stay there. <laughs> you are allowed to. <laughs> okay. So, 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 so the thing was, how do we get away of this statistical vision that's not very helpful to decision making into the innovation process? This is what was the, let's say, the antecedents of all this work we did in China. So the main, the main topic uh, when we were working uh, on technological learning at the time we began in, in China was that you had a sort of evolution that had happened since uh, when we began in early 2000. You had already 25 years of economic policy of opening. So, uh, you had a whole new industry that was 
appearing in mainly on the coastal zone of China. Uh, and all these people, the question was, are there innovators as we were studying in Latin America or are they just doing something that already happens elsewhere which is just creating companies and out of these companies producing? So th this was one of the first question. A second question was, okay, suppose we have a clue of what's happening and why it happens in China at that moment precisely. Um, we consider that we have it, but we're well, going to delve on that later. Suppose we have a, an explanation on that. What's the conditions of these going away from simply having a basic economic development of a simple industry, which would be a sort of linear view of first you have a first step industry, then a second step, and then so on. So. Is there something that makes you jump from one step to the other? Is there something like a, um, a particular kind of item that allows you to uh, jump from a simple production system to a more sophisticated and elaborated one. So uh, part of the difficulty there is that we are on two different levels of observation. One level of, of observation, and I think this is very important for what you are studying when you study innovation or, or development or uh, this kind of issues. One kind of one type of level is the one when I was talking about all these things, I was talking about firms. I was not talking about industries. So one thing is that your first level is that if you observe firms. And what the hell happens in the firms is the first level. And then there's a second level, and this level could be the economy. I don't know what really means the economy, but it's that, that, that was supposed to be the level. The economy is this suppo supposed to be this level that, uh, that Robert Boyer puts in tables that nobody understands. But that, that's the economy. <laughs> so the economy is a, is a conceptualization that is as a level of generalization that is absolutely uh, <coughs> englobing every kind of possible unit interacting between itself and, 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 and what we call another abstract thing called the market, okay? Which is as abstract as, as uh, the only thing that's abstract in there is the firms. And, and, if you, and if you go inside the firm, then you can say the same thing about firms. Firms are not at all. It's also an abstract thing because what's really, what's really concrete is the groups inside the firms. But, but let, let's say that you have this kind of two levels. So you have a macro level and you have a micro level. What economists of innovation are saying since 30 or 40 years is that no, everything happens in a sort of intermediate, a sort of intermediate level, something that they call the meso level. Industries. That's the meso level. Industries worked for 20 years. So you had industries. And then after the industries, you had clusters of industries. It's also meso level that's a little less meso than the other, but it's meso also. Or you have simply clusters alone of groups of companies, which is also meso level, which is different because it's not defined by statistics, but it's defined by the localization, geographical localization of the companies. The geographical localization is an important data, and it's a data that's manageable by policy. It works to move a company from one place to another. Not only it move, it works. It's a process of learning. Because whenever you go from one place to another, you have to take decision on resources, on personnel, on capital, on whatever. There's also when you move from, from one floor to another in a, in a building, it works the same way. If you go in a small company that's located on the fourth floor that goes to the first floor and it changes its way, it, its interaction goes with how materials get in and get out of the company. It works in the same way. They learn. It also works when you take a piece of the process out of the company, you externalize it, you give it to some other provider, and you say, you are going to provide me with, I don't know, pellets of plastics, and I will do the, b the bottles. And with, which, is, which is something that happened very, very much at the early stages of industry, where you have the tendency to have conglomerates that go from the first material, the more basic 
materials to the more sophisticated end products. And then in the process, you have sort of sophistication of the process, a specialization of, of units. So you have this kind of dispersion. So, so the meso level could be also the clusters of providers of a company. Something also, also very different. So the unit there is not the, indus is not the industry, it's not the localization. It's the fact that you are the provider of some big firm or some firm. For example, when um, Nissan creates its first company in, 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 in Guadalajara, or was it in some other place? I don't remember exactly. Uh, they, they had to bring with them all their providers of, of, of everything, from tools, machine tools, material, everything. So suddenly, in less than 10 years, you had 150 companies that arrived around around one <coughs> productive unit. So this meso level is as complicated as the, the macro level. So for me, it's more or less the same thing. It's just that it's conceptualized differently by economics as a science or as a government uh, uh, entity, as a government uh, matter of interest, as Latour says. Okay. So, so here we have, j'avais dit qu'il était communauté, j'avais dit qu'il était collectif, et j'avais dit qu'il était situated locally. So I have a process that I can describe empirically when I go to a company. I have companies that I can identify, and I know they want, they have an interaction. So what I'm saying here is very general in terms of what the entity firm is. So, but the firm itself, I was saying, is learning. In fact, it's learning from these processes which is the learning process itself, OK? And it's also learning from its interaction with the, its environment. Interactions with mainly its providers, which can be whichever number of providers. And it's the governments around it with government officials in all the entities where they can find government officials, OK? And it's clients, OK? J'ai parlé déjà combien de temps? Half an hour? So I'm, pra so I'm practically on my half hour. Uh, so so what, when we began to work on the Chinese uh, terrain, I began with Zhao Wei, who was doing his PhD thesis at that time, and who is now a professor of economics. Um, I'm very happy he's here, but a lot of because a lot of people think I, it's my pseudo, it's my Chinese pseudo is Zhao Wei. It's not; <laughs> it's a real person. <laughs> and and what we began doing was to go and see all these myriad of small companies that were uh, created between 1985 and 2000, and the. The discourse at that time, which you find in, in articles of Lucas, for example, or all these uh, um, economic um, analysis, <coughs> macroeconomic analysis, was something that was saying, well, it's the miracle of the Chinese growth. So growth really was a miracle thing. It, it just happened. I mean, uh, OK, we just opened the door and it happened. There's a guy called Chuan. I, I don't remember his name, who was working for the World Bank at that time, who said, no, no, it's new economic institutions that created things. There was uh, another person that um, was saying, no, it's because suddenly all the money that was accumulated from so many years backwards that they never used suddenly <coughs> came to the market. So people invested massively. In fact, some truth lies into all this, of course. But the thing is, if you have an external explanation to the actors you observe in industrial development, you don't understand nothing. Because basically, what you find into, into the interactions that the actors have with their environments is the reason of the miracle. And when they interact, they interact in all these dimensions, with the capital, with hiring people, with buying things, 
with locating clients, and so on and so forth. One of the things that the Chinese did not know was who their clients were, where they were located, because they had no previous history of how to locate their clients. So very, very quickly, they found that the kind of clients they are contacting are people whom they don't know what they need, what are their needs, where they work, who, the, who are the French, the, the, the Germans, the, even the Taiwanese or Singapore people who came, and they came back because they were from Chinese origin. And these people called the Hua Xiao, they came back and were investing in China. But the Chinese did not really know what the, who they were. What do they come from? What do they need? What is their society? What is their market? Because you want to know a market, you know to have to know the people. OK, so they began interacting with these clients through agents, intermediates, people who were sellers, buyers, most of them, people who go to China to find the cheap things and to sell it expensive here. So they, they began interacting with these people. These people bring them ideas. And very quickly, they find out that these small companies are not all reliable, but some of, some of them are really reliable in terms of production. And, and they don't only produce the thing that's going to be destroyed in half an hour after you use it. So, <laughs> so there, there's, in order to, to get some knowledge and to get some certainty that it's going to work as a productive relationship, between you, who is a buyer, going to intermediate with a foreign market, and the guy who's producing locally, because he has the capacity to create a company, to invest, to, to hire people, and so on and so forth, there's a close relation that begins, that begins to be created. This close relation is fundamental, because the guy is a client. That's what is important. Okay. He's not just a provider, the government, whatever. He's a client. He's going to buy the bloody shit. So you have to have it now. You have to produce it. You, he has to, and he will give you blueprints. I want it to be like this, like that, white, big, brown, chrome, not chrome, with a blue uh, pa column on it, and thing, like whatever. And all these specifications for the product, all the blueprints for the product, are really the way for the company to learn how to produce. This, this production gets into sort of routine. You learn how to do. And then you have a fantastic advantage. You are Chinese. OK? He is not. And the guy who is Chinese, he has the Chinese market. Okay? Whereas the other guy, he has the French or German or whatever, no? or US market or whatever which is inaccessible for this person. It's far away, it's too expensive, I don't know. So what the company does is that it learns from this client, it produces for this market through this client, and it also produces for this market. Okay, Diffusion, a very simple diffusion process. That happens in myriads of small companies dispersed in a very large environmental way, with a lot of capital coming from foreign sources that interacts quite easily with the local companies with, um, with a sort of, with a sort of uh, um, smooth process that was regular for a period until the crisis of the 80s of the end of the 80s, uh, where uh, things began to be complicated because the kind of investors you had had less money to invest. Or so you, you problems that appear because you begin to produce only for a market. But the local market was growing. It was growing. And your learning process, this thing that we said before, is just enough to guarantee that this process happens by itself. Okay. All I said here is problematic. There's not one single word of what I said that is not a question in the economics literature. Because there's nothing automatic in any of the processes I'm mentioning. Among other things, that's why uh, Weyer's uh, tables are complicated. 
Well, among other things, <laughs> among other things, one of the one of the um, basic difficulties is that uh, economics pretends to have, as a discipline, uh, sort of general rules on how investment decisions are taken. And what we are saying when we observe companies goes a step beyond that thing. I mean, we consider that the investment is going to be done anyway. If they want to produce, they're going to do it, whatever. It's not a matter of uh, choosing between a portfolio of opportunities. It's you have to. You depend upon that. Your life depends upon that. If you don't do it, you're dead. Simple as that. So this kind of inelect ineluctable thing, the thing that you really need to invest on that, on these companies, which is very characteristic of small and medium companies, was very important. It also is based on, on an assumption, why, why it's problematic for economics, not for us. It's, uh, economics makes an assumption that we go to the market and compete. We make no assumptions about the markets. Markets are whatever they are. We just make the assumption that they grow, which is a hard assumption. It's yeah, true. And when they don't grow, what happens is a complicated issue. Because it relates to prices, to competition, and to things like that. But when, whenever you have an economic explanation of industrial development, is usually related to how markets are considered by social actors, by socioeconomic actors. We don't do any kind of assumption on the kind of analysis that the actors do concerning the market. They consider the market through the eyes of their clients, and, their, and, the, and, and that's the main assumption that we are doing. Companies see the market through the eyes of their clients. And they do it in a way that they can valorize internally into their own productive process towards outside, towards producing something. I said nothing about China, no? Yes, this is very good because uh, Joe is here. OK, the, the dynamic is I'm talking 20 minutes, something like that, half an hour. They have a comment. And then we interact with the comments. Thank you. OK, so uh, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, me and Christopher, we are going to sum up Mr. Arvaniti's presentation. We are going to bring new ideas to the table. We are going to ask a few questions at the end. Um, so as you might have noticed, the topic is innovation in China. And uh, as you might know by now, no one understands China better than Donald Trump. But we are going, <laughs> but, uh, we are going to try to dig a little bit deeper. And uh, here is the table of content. First of all, uh, Christopher is going to talk about the theoretical framework. And then we're going to talk about two articles on which the presentation was based. And then we're going to bring complementary topics uh, that extend um, the debate and justify a few of, of our questions. So, um. so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, First, we're gonna st I'm going to present you a theoretical framework so you uh, know exactly uh, what, ch which is what are the basis of uh, the two professors' work. Uh, so we're going to start with neoclassical. Uh, the problem with the neoclassical theory is that they, even though they have, uh, uh, through Solon, uh, uh, elements of uh, R&D and human capital, they still cannot explain technology and technological pro, uh, change. So, and they consider it still as an exogenous uh, element. Uh, so the, through the institutional approach, you have names as Freeman, Ludvo, and, they, and the national system of, system of innovation uh, tries to explain how the, the uh, innovation uh, on the interactions between agents. 
and the, and this pro the process of innovation is a result of interaction among the different types of innovation, not only firms, but government and, and other types. Uh, but one problem that uh, Kuriyar and Weinstein characterized is that uh, they still have this uh, representative firm uh, issue, which makes them, uh, they consider firms, like all firms have the same uh, Routines. They 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 don't they don't classify. Uh, they, they don't they don't acknowledge that firms can have different results based on internal aspects. Um, and for them, obviously, innovation process and, and dynamic are endogenous. On the other hand, the organizational theory uh, they mostly concern the structure and strategies of the firm. So uh, from this point of view, they, they really acknowledge the, the diversity of organizations for, uh, and firms' patterns that, that come through routines and the, a variety of individuals within the firm that results in different routines of companies and, and this variety. But at the same time, they neglect external factors. That uh, and the situation. So in a way, those two uh, theories, they are complementary, they grew up together uh, but in a way, they, they didn't ex exactly interact to, to, uh, in the same way. That's why I, I present you the, the new theory that uh, Korea and Weston had developed in 2002, that basically puts, uh, 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 presents, uh, they, they have a core of organi the organizational theory, but introduce institutions as constraints and resources. Constraints, uh, what it means? They have this kind of a filter. The, the firms react to what is exposed in the, in the external factor, but at the same time, they can be sources of resource, resources. One reason is that uh, regular, regulatory systems, they can uh, they develop rules, but they have some sort of marginal, uh, marginal uh, action that the company can take because it's not uh, exactly uh, fully, uh, it, 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 it has some, some sort of flexibility. So, what well the thing is, what I'm, what I'm, why I presented this, uh, is that one of the questions of the article was, uh, why there's this mismatch between the nat national policies and, uh, and how, uh, the, the companies innovate, the majority of the companies innovate. So, in a way, they explain that you can have subsystems of uh, innovation within a national system of innovation. So, it could, it could be a, a good theory. But the, the article is basically uh, based on those two, uh, those two uh, theoretical frameworks. So, what is the relevance of the first paper from 2006? From Avanitis and uh, how do you pr how do I pronounce your name? Zhao, and Zhao. Uh, so it, the first one it, from 2006 it aims to explain an obvious development of Guangdong, looking to the technological learning of firms. And his main thesis is technological learning is taking place in a large variety of medium-sized companies, not so much through technological transfers from foreign firms that invest in China. Uh, or through some providers such as university technical centers or consultants, but through their foreign clients. And this is studies based on a series of interviews and a selection of six cases that would best uh, represent what they call the emerging industrial sector. What I chose to show you was the two uh, main interactions that uh, translate into the relationship bet, uh, with clients. The first one be contract with a client, which is less formal, but has a long-term relationship with the client. In what they explain is that no formal technology transfer, but their suppliers of technology are final clients, transmitting quality, spe quality specifications and productive procedures. The second one, this is um, original equipment manufacturer. Uh, it's kind of like uh, outsourcing some uh, some parts of the uh, chain um, production uh, in within China, but it's from a foreign company. So what they explain, is, but this kind of uh, technological transfer, uh, it's based mainly on learning by monitoring design proposals and quality checks. 
It's just a quick review. Okay, so the second article uh, investigates uh, how much Chinese innovation has contributed to Chinese economic growth. And the answer is not as much as we think, because except for a few Chinese superstar companies like Lenovo, Hayer, and Huawei, the most of China's emerging companies, they reinforce their production capacity uh, rather than, than their technological innovation capacity. And uh, basically, there is a mismatch in the Chinese innovation system. The innovation um, policy in China is still very based towards serving state companies, but uh, actually, the um, technological learning is taking place mostly in non-state uh, companies. So, uh, basically, the innovation policy in China it lacks efficiency. And the um, article explores the reasons why the innovation efforts, efforts in China uh, haven't led to a high degree of innovation. Um, and now we're going to talk about... Um, the limits in China's innovation system. So there are lots of, of, of there are lots of limits. Uh, in most cases, multinational companies in China uh, they only bring the country the capacity for assembly and processing work. Uh, the Chinese uh, institutional uh, infrastructure um, hinders communication, coordination, and cooperation across the different actors in the Chinese innovation system. Um, small, medium uh, companies and non-state companies benefit little from the government's R&D projects. The Chinese finance uh, systematically provides resources to state firms mostly. And uh, consumers' low disposable income leads to a demand for conventional products, uh, which doesn't contribute too much for the um, uh, technological, for the development of technological capacity. Um, well, um, although state companies have easier access to financial resources and to public centers of res uh, research and universities. Many studies point out that the state companies, they have uh, their innovation capacity is quite flimsy. And uh, m we are going to try to point out some of the reasons. Uh, state companies' investment in innovation suffers from competition. Over the past two decades, a large proportion of their investments were made in social benefits in order to maintain social and political stability in China. Uh, Overprotected state companies are sheltered from market pressure and are scarcely motivated towards learning and innovation. This kind of protection um, is made through the management of exchange rates, custom duties, etc. Okay, uh, and there is another uh, and there is another reason for why state companies that don't do that well, and uh, I forgot to put it here, but the uh, Mr. Arvanitis said, uh, told us it's uh, the lack of access to their clients. They're, they have intermediates like retailers, so they don't know, they don't get in touch with their clients, so maybe that's why state companies don't do that well in, in the innovation system there. Uh, so we're g I'm going to talk about the first complementary topic, uh, which is about the in a institutional inf uh, structure of innovation policies in China. Uh, this article, Leo's article, um, illustrates the lack of coordination in, in the Chinese innovation system. Uh, we can see that from the 80s to the to 2005, uh, almost three quarters of the innovation policies were issued by a single agency. And in most cases, it w the, this agency was the Ministry of Science and Technology. And according to the orders, um, its power to mobilize other ministries were quite limit in limited in this period. And uh, 
from the last innovation program in China, uh, the, the level of coordination actually uh, increased, uh, at least on paper. Um, um, the authors say that the coordination level across, cr the, the cross-ministry coordination level has increased, and, uh, but nevertheless, nothing is said about local government agencies. So uh, that leads to, actually the majority of the agencies there have names like National Bureau of something, National Commission for something, and uh, it's very curious. So th that leads to my question. Is the underdeveloped coordination between national and local levels in China a reflection of the authoritarian political regime in China or an accident? And it, get, it can get better or it, it is because of the political regime there? Um, so we cannot talk about uh, technological t uh, transfer without talking about absorptive capacity, which is the ability of the company to to understand and, and assimilate uh, in general terms uh, to assimilate a new technology. They cannot if they don't if they don't have this ability, they cannot even if they have the technology, they cannot make a, a good use use of it. So and. To talk about this, I decided to go to in the context of COP21. Uh, and one of the, uh, the, the things that got out of the uh, Kyoto Protocol was the, uh, this clean development mechanisms, which uh, it's a way to give flexibility to countries that have signed the, the Kyoto Protocol to, uh, to uh, B uh, ha invest uh, in, in clean energy projects in emerging countries. So they have some sort of like with the, if, for instance, if they have like a target of emission uh, reduction, they can use these uh, projects and invest in an in emerging country such as Brazil, China, and they can have some sort of uh, uh, benefit in, uh, and benefit from it. Uh, so, but this, as she said, uh, once uh, once companies in development can take part in this uh, CDM projects, they accumulate a range of technology capabilities and competence, which may have spillovers effects on the country's economy and facilitate diffusion of clean technology. So, my 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 question is, how would you evaluate this mechanism through the point of view of technological learning? Is it a good way uh, to do it uh, besides foreign foreign client relationship? Okay, the third complementary topic is about uh, multinationals and foreign R and D. Uh, we know that everyone knows that there are a lot of multinational companies in in China, um, and uh, it was stated before that. Uh, multinational companies in China mostly uh, bring China the capacity for assembly and processing work. And uh, regarding the multinational companies' uh, R&D activities in China, the scenario is actually not promising uh, as well. Um, this article um, makes two important points about foreign R&D in China. First, the majority of foreign R&D investments in China are involved in adaptive development rather than in truly innovative research. And the majority of foreign firms will only invest in R&D when they feel the competition from domestic firms. And such results can, uh, can bring... Uh, can, uh, can bring us to the conclusion that it is more worth it to uh, invest in endogenous uh, innovation and uh, domestic firms than to depend on multinational companies, foreign R&D. And uh, this, this is actually not an empirical uh, result, but most scholars say, say that foreign R&D in a country doesn't automatically generate spillovers for this country's domestic firms. So uh, uh, getting together these three points, 
we might as well think, are multinational uh, companies strategically important to the, to the development of endogenous innovation? And if so, in which circumstances and until what point? Uh, so the fourth topic would be uh, foreign currency versus innovation policy. Uh, what we have in the early foreign currency uh, task that China has to accumulate reserves in a way uh, through exports, in a way you have some sort of uh, immediate aspect of this uh, Catch up process like we want technology now. It doesn't matter. You, even uh, this can it can sometimes compromise the endogenous development of technology uh, development of technology in China. And my question is: uh, China's uh, strategy of reserves accumulation through exports and immediate economic growth strategy wouldn't be one of the reasons for the for the productive capacity not to translate into innovation capacity. And now we have two specific questions within uh, to, uh, to the articles that we have read. <laughs> um, to what point can the government force to the company-client relationship due to the fact that uh, it's considered uh, in the article the best way to to technological learning? And the second one, it's among the interviews, was there a successful case in which the company uh, learned by uh, by contact with clients and it and it didn't succeed or it wasn't uh, it wasn't have a, a, a good uh, uh, good uh, uh, performance in 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 technological uh, learning capabilities. So, thank you very much. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven questions, not two. No. <laughs> 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 no, no, I mean. It's not two questions, it's seven questions. Come on. Okay. Why the national innovation system um, is different in different places? And that has been a real topic for us as an empirical topic. Shall I talk about later about this? The national and the local government policies in China. No, but if you because this is the, to the topic of uh, you have different innovation in different regions. And, it, and there's, a, there's a mismatch between what happens at the national level and what happens at the local level. Because this is useful, is, yeah, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting topic we try to study. Because it's true that what we uh, ex ex were looking for was local uh, things. So whenever we needed to go, we didn't consider at the beginning policies at all. Um, so maybe I'll try to explain a little bit about the relationships between relationship between Chinese central government and local governments. Um, uh, I will put it very in a very straight straight way uh, to to say that I think before the uh, arrival at the power of Xi Jinping, you have uh, the local governments in China didn't care very much about the uh, the decision of uh, central government. So what you have showed in the paper by Mr. Liu and uh, uh, the co-authors. I think it, it is a representative uh, point of view of the central government, uh, especially in the Ministry of uh, Science and Technology. Uh, so they, uh, they followed very much uh, closely uh, the foreign theories and approaches about uh, science and technology policy, especially uh, the popular, the so-called popular in the period of time, uh, the national system of innovation. And so in, they introduced uh, these concepts, um, I think, in the end of 1990s, uh, 
by some key uh, scholars which had experience and contacts with uh, foreign research circles. And then they uh, finally decided to put it in uh, the official uh, document and official policy, which is called the, the Chinese National uh, Science and Technology uh, Development Plan uh, until 2020. Uh, um, so it, it was, if you check the, the major points of that plan, it was uh, totally under the, uh, in the framework of a national uh, system of innovation and emphasized a lot, very much on institution construction, uh, a lot on the structural uh, forces which will determine uh, the performance of uh, uh, the innovation capacities of firms uh, or other uh, technological development, uh, de te technological and scientific breakthroughs uh, uh, for a nation. Um, so basically this kind of um, uh, policy, if you check the central government's policy, the documents, official announcements, the, the speeches of the ministers, uh, you will find all these con contents. But if you uh, had dialogues and interviews with the local um, officials, uh, the mayors, uh, the governors, or the, uh, the office, office holders, uh, they, the normal response is that, yes, we will follow the, the central government, but we have our specific situation in our uh, province in our city, in our uh, district, or in our town. So you have a, a, the whole situation that before 2012, I, sh I can be quite sure about that, is to say that you have the announced, officially announced uh, central government policy uh, on innovation, uh, which is called uh, national system uh, innovation policy. And you have the practices and the, the concrete measures taken by the, uh, the local governments. So one of the local governments which is very typical in such a kind of case is the uh, uh, provincial government of Guangdong province, uh, which is uh, the f uh, the maybe the, the place which is f uh, f most far away uh, from, the from Beijing. Uh, so you have uh, local governments who decided to, to, to make their uh, efforts and to, uh, to try something uh, which is different from the central governments. And also you have the, uh, the feedback, of course, from the uh, local governments, which mm, from time to time they wrote a report and responded to the, uh, some questions from the central government. So you have the ideas of, um, for example, uh, the industrial uh, clusters or uh, innovation clusters, which are progressively um, uh, diffused and uh, um, spread out uh, through the country, and it is uh, reason to the uh, um, uh, raised to the central government also. Um, so the situation, yes, I, I think that's. Uh, y if you ask the what is the, uh, it's by accident, or it is uh, because of you have authoritarian regime of the country. I think no, it is not by accident. It is always, it is always like that. It is not because it is an uh, authoritarian regime. On the contrary, it is because a country under the um, a superficial uh, phase of uh, centralization, you had the reality, which is a very decentralized um, country uh, in, at that moment. I should say that when the new uh, leader, Xi Jinping, took the power, he realized a lot of problems. So one of his measures is to centralize uh, the the power and authority uh, of the country. So today, if you go to China, yes, of course, uh, it is very much uh, centralized, much more centralized than a few years ago. Uh, but at the same time, you had the, uh, the problems. Uh, the problem is that, th that if you check the Chinese newspapers and news report, it is about the initia and the uh, unwillingness of the uh, local governments to take initiatives to make decisions and to to do something useful. Uh, so this is also very much criticized even by the prime minister and by the top leaders in in China because you you centralize the the power and then you cue uh, the initiative and the in, uh, entrepreneurial uh, spirit of the local uh, officials, which were in fact the key one of the key drivers uh, of the uh, industrialization and technological learning and development. Uh, uh, in, in, in China. So uh, nowadays I should say the, the, the balance is very much uh, biased on 
uh, the central government's uh, decision making. So the new policy, new central policy is called innovation driven strategy. Um, but you have that and last year, oh no, this year, the, the summer of when I um, went back to China and worked with uh, some colleagues from the uh, Ministry of uh, Science and Technology, they asked me to say that if we have uh, the central policy of uh, um, innovation driven strategy, yes, that is our total uh, uh, overall strategy, what would be the concrete measures taken uh, by the local uh, authorities? So we visited also some uh, the some districts and some cities uh, in Guangdong province. Uh, so there uh, they began to learn something, also learn something, absorb something uh, from the local practices. Um, so uh, what if you if you like, uh, I I will tell that one of the um, uh, emerging uh, concepts which the local governments initiated a lot and um, more and more accepted by the central government is um, which has a tendency to replace uh, the formal national system of innovation concept and approach is called the ecosystem of innovation approach. Uh, so the ecosystem approach is very much practiced and, uh, and experimented uh, by the uh, local uh, governments nowadays in, uh, in different places in, uh, in, in China. So the, so the, the, the relationship is, uh, uh, is still uh, very um, not easy to handle that, uh, but uh, it is true that in China you never have a situation where you have a, a order from the top and it will be fully implemented, executed uh, without any default and without any discount at uh, the, at the local level. And so we have a Chinese proverb which is that you have uh, 上有政策,下有对策, which means you above you have, on the top you have uh, policy, uh, 下有对策, uh, at the bottom, at the basis level that we have, uh, we have our own uh, reaction, reactive uh, measures. <laughs> that's uh, my explanation. I love it. Thank you. That's, that's how China works. So the thing is that it looks very, very monolithic, but in reality, this sort of extraordinary uh, complex of different situations. So that partly responds to some of the questions about it. I, I'd like to add, uh, since we're in a class at the university, about this thing about diffusion of innovation. You know that diffusion of innovation, there's a very good book on that, uh, written by late uh, Everett uh, Rogers, who says that we'll take the epidemiological curve of a disease, of a dispersion of a disease, and we study, it's always a logistic curve, something that goes like that. So at the beginning, there's early adopters, then it grows, then it grows, and then sometime it goes there. And you never know what is going to happen. It's going to grow there, and going to fall there, what happens, okay. Part of the, part, it, it, it partly responds to what happened at least in the 21st years after the policy of opening up of the economy in China something similar happened. And it looks like a miracle as the diffusion of a virus, which is a bit miraculous. Why does it suddenly <laughs> grow? But in fact, uh, when, you, when, you, when you see among the things that happened at that time, local governments were not taking decisions. Their main decision was not to take a decision. And, and in, they were participating in the process as one among the others. That's, that's a period where you had a lot of companies that had very funny uh, uh, capital structures. We called them red hats at that time because they were local, locally, they appeared as being belonging to the government, but in reality, they were not. They were private uh, money, money or activities from private people. So you had a sort of uh, indefinite structure for a long time. And partly uh, like what I was calling productive corruption. So it's, it's people that were in the governments participating into the economy, the local economy. And all this thing was under control and had no problem in terms of coordination because the idea was not to coordinate. Just let it happen. That, that, was, the, that was it. And, and, and for a long period of time, that was OK because it was growing. Whenever it was growing, everybody's happy, so no problem. 
So as long as it grows, there's no problem. The problem begins when it doesn't grow. And, and, and that's when the first policies that Zhao Wei was mentioning began there to say, OK, let's see. Finally, there's first level of development, which is a sort of technological capacity. And then out of that, we are going to have a second level where we have an innovation capacity. I personally believe it's the same thing. It's just a question of experience. If we take seriously what I said at the beginning, that the process is cumulative, collective, and idiosyncratic, that it belongs to each company, to, to each entity that learns, then you just have to do it. That's all. So it, it will end up growing. And it stops the day that you stop it. It doesn't stop just because it doesn't turn not to be innovation because you are you could do it more or less with more or less money, with more or less markets, with more or less clients, with more or less interaction. But it's not it's not a question of 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 uh, sort of uh, structural difference between what is technological development and what is innovative development or innovation based development. So this idea that you have a policy that is better fitted for innovation as opposed to a policy that would be an industrial policy, a mere industrial, a simple industrial policy, is wrong. Simply wrong. Simple and plainly wrong. You just need to have an industrial policy and that it needs to say to the social actors that are involved in that, mainly firms, but not only, but mainly firms, just to do the thing. OK, I, th I know it's a neoliberal thing, what I'm saying, but it's, <laughs> it's complicated. The government has nothing to do. Donald Trump is right. <laughs> the, the, difficulties, the difficulties you have is a difficulty that has to do with what are the policy structures that you are surrounded of on other matters. Because a firm is not only producing things is not only doing innovation, it's also uh, hiring people, it's also using the local resources, and so on and so forth. OK. Um, so, so, so the thing about Korea, no? there's constraints. Uh, policies are, are also resources, but they can be also constraints, which is, which is I think, basically a, a good way of, of thinking of, about that. Uh, something about uh, an, another question about the um, FDI and R&D. We have studied that with uh, Xiaowe. We went to see R&D units. Most of the big companies that you know of, Chinese companies that you know of today, are former R&D centers. Most, if not all. I'm probably not wrong if I say that 90% of them are former R&D centers. So they were initially not industrial companies. There was Sanjo, for example, was a pharmaceutical department laboratory of a, big, of a big hospital in the south of China. It's the biggest pharmaceutical company in the south of China today, one of the biggest of the world. Huawei is an exception. It's probably one of the very small exceptions. But it was based on an R&D activity mainly. And when I visited Huawei the first time, uh, it was in, in 2002, they had 14,000 employees out of which 12,000 were engineers working in the R&D center. Which it means basically it was an R&D unit. That's what it, what it was. They were not producing anything. They were just testing their servers and their machines. and their. And th they had three R&D center centers outside China, one in Dallas, one in Sweden with Ericsson, not by pure chance, and one was in, I don't remember the third one, I think I wrote it in some paper. I forgot which one it was. It was three cents, which is more than strange. A new company out of nowhere, created by a former general of the army, working for the army, providing telecommunications for the army, has suddenly 14,000 engineers working in R&D, not producing nothing. Just telecommunication system in Xinjiang province because they test all of the telecommunications without, without uh, hardwire. 
After that, they become the managers of the Zimbabwe government telephone system, Thailand telephone system, and they learn how to enter into the business of managing a telecommunication system, full, a full-fledged telecommunication system. And basically, it's a research unit that grows, a research and development unit that grows. Uh, the actual Lenovo was a research center in, in, in electronics uh, in Qingdao, was it? Lenovo? In Xinjiang. In Xinjiang, yeah. So basically, all of these centers were, were research units. And the ones that are known to produce, for example, um, air conditioned coolers, uh, white lines, and all that, that were, they were usually companies that were from this uh, kind of companies we were mentioning, small, small companies producing on a small scale and that grow and, and in, in, the south, in the south of China. And they were not very much based on R&D. They were very much based on, on this capacity to produce regularly uh, and, and, and then they were not trying to be the, the best ones in, the, in their market. They were just trying to survive <laughs> in their market, which was very difficult. There was a, a precedent to that when the industry begins to grow in China in the early 80s, on the late 80s, on the TV market begins to grow. They, they had some, I don't remember numbers, enormous quantity of companies producing TVs. And they all disappeared in less than five years. And the competition between them was absolutely terrible. Some survived, but basically the, the fight had, has been very, 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 the struggle has been very hard. Part of the difficulty is this kind of access to technology. One of the main difficulties these companies, that's the key message. The main difficulty for these kind of companies when you do development out of nowhere in the middle of the desert is that you need to have a source of technology. If you don't have a source of technology, you won't build it out of thin air. You need to have some context. And it's not only your market that gives you the technology. You have to build it somewhere. You have to, to, to accumulate on that. Uh, by the way, I never define what I call technological learning. Technology is just an experience of technological practices. That's all. It's an accumulation of experiences of technological practices. You, you did it so you know how to do it. So you repeat it afterwards. And, and, and this, 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 this is why it's a process that's very much grounded on the earth and very little driven by policy. What happens with, uh, you want to introduce, for example, better technologies like uh, green technologies, no? COP21 and all that, since we have not finished, tomorrow fin thing finished, the, the, the completely failed negotiation finishes tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> well, what happens is, in as much it enters your technological process, learning process, you will, you will adopt this kind of technologies. But you have to have a previous experience in managing the technologies. So somewhere uh, you, need to, you need to enter into the, 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 new, the new resource that it can be for you, which, which is the complicated part of that. Because you won't enter into managing a new technology if it does not serve your immediate purposes. You said it in your, in, your, in your presentation. I mean, there is this thing about you will never enter into, if you have limited resources, which is the case of 99.9% .9 persons except Donald Trump, you won't, enter, you won't enter into a new technological field if you don't have the assurance of an immediate success on this technology. That's why the, the, the that that's explains part of the Chinese miracles. They adopted technologies that were brought by their clients. They had no problem about immediate success. It was in the deal. The deal is I have a client, the client brings me the technology, I use the technology, I implement it, I produce for the clients. I don't care what he does with the end product. End of story. Um, Foreign R&D, when the last thing I read about that, 
uh, was the people, the group in Tsinghua studying on foreign technologies in foreign research centers. It was a group of uh, Chinese and, and, Amer and uh, German engineers, uh, economists working on that. They had counted something like more than 400 research centers created by foreign companies in China. Um, I don't know. It's 400 companies doing R&D. 400 R&D centers. We suspect from the, from the cases we know that they have nothing to do with um, the local market. In fact, they, they profit on cheap engineers. And a Chinese engineer costs one third of the price of a German engineer. So it's a good deal. Uh, instead of having my R&D unit in, 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 in Köln, I'll have him in, in some place in Wuhan. Um, the, there, is a real, there is a real difficulty in, in, in that. It's that it means that these R&D units are not only offshore respect to their mother company, they are also offshore respect to the productive process. Because the 400 and so company R&D units that have been uh, mentioned by the studies we saw are not linked to a nationally based uh, productive unit. So some of them, yes, some of them, but mostly not. Mostly they are uh, scientists. Then you have um, another question ab about R&D, which is, uh, does it, does it really, um, does it really serve uh, this uh, technological process uh, by coordination with other, with other units, with other centers, with other, and so on? The main role of an R&D unit in an environment where you don't have a big trajectory, and that was also a result of the studies in, in Mexico, for example, or, or in Brazil, was that the, the R&D unit does not really serve as a um, research projects unit. It's not, they don't do it on a basis, okay, we're going to explore a new project and we're going to invest money into finding out if we can use this new process into the production. No, it's not that. They, they, what they do is they have to deal with a problem. The problem comes from one unit of the company. They come to them and say, this shit does not work, make it work. That's the question. Okay, so this troubleshooting does sometimes go to some levels of technology that can be higher. For example, I documented one of the biggest innovations in the phosphate industry, which is liquid filtering in, in phosphates, was invented by an engineering team uh, that had to deal with contamination of the classic phosphate uh, industry. Phosphates are used for soap, it's a stone. You break the stones, so it makes a lot of, 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 of de la poussière, of uh, dust. It's contaminating absolutely everything and killing people working in the companies. And it's absolutely horrible. So an, an alternative to that is you do it in a liquid phase. So you, you put drown it in water, and then you filter the water and retain the, proper, the chemical properties of the, of the phosphates that you re-inject into the into the process. Uh, this, this filtering process is complicated in chemical terms. And it was invented by a team that had to deal with simply, or we close the company or we continue. Just as simple as that. And they, they, m the team managed that in less than one year. Mexican engineers with two uh, foreign American engineers, chemi chemical engineers that were going to Mexico just to have fun. That's, that's really what, how, how it happened. So, 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 so the, the thing is, uh, the kind of, the kind of uh, R&D that's developed, if it's not linked to a, an industrial interest, it won't, it won't grow. It won't, it won't work. Is there um, investment strategies or financial strategies for the Chinese that uh, promote or not innovation or or, or make it, do not lead to innovation, no? That was the question. 
not the last one, the, the last before last. Yeah. Foreign reserves. Foreign reserves. He knows. I don't know. He, I have absolutely no idea. He knows. I need to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> the question was this, uh, this is accumulation of reserves starting. Yeah, if it, yeah, if it, if it uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, implies in this uh, idiot. So you, you don't invest the money, you just keep it in there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because uh, what they want is to produce and export to accumulate reserves. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, there's two responses. One is uh, Michel Aglietta, who knows, and I don't know, or maybe Jawel, I don't know. It has to do with the reserves of China and so on. The other one is technology transfer never works. Technology transfer is the idea that was uh, brought in the 60s by, uh, in this uh, developmentalist uh, theory that was saying that you have a technology that works somewhere and you sell it or provide it uh, to some other place, to some client, and then you have a contract of negotiating or paqueted that technology, it was called in, in, in Brazil. But the idea was that you have a, a package of technological things, you, d you make an arrangement on that, and then people buy it, and because they bought it and it works elsewhere, it will work here. It never works. What I'm saying here is that if you want it to work, it could be an experience to negotiate the technology. Okay, so you have a technology that produces thin film plastics for, for, for doing packaging. To do that, I need pellets of plastics of a certain quantity of, of polymers. If I don't have this kind of polymers, what do I do? I don't have them. If you sell me a technology that does something where I don't have half of the resources, how do I manage with it? Maybe I can do it by importing the technology or the resources. What's so you enter into negotiating the technology, which means that you don't buy it. You learn it. You, d you dismantle the package. You try to understand the pieces. Then you can have a commercial deal behind saying, OK, I'll produce for you the, this or that, and then and then I keep the technology and I manage it as I want, but then you, you, you let, I let you the market or the other way around. I sell technology for market, market for technology, something like that, and it, and it will work. It's, the main thing is that you won't never be able to grab a technology somewhere and just implement it somewhere else if you don't have a process of learning taking place locally. Let me give you an example, which is a real story. Uh, in, Buenos Aires, in 1984, I think it was, or maybe a bit later, 86, 80, 80, when, when Jorge Walter was doing his PhD thesis, he found out in, in Buenos Aires a robot. There was a big commercial fair. And there was an American company selling one of the first robots, you know, which was a big, a big, a big hand that, um, with circuits and so on and so forth. To, uh, for um, uh, white line, for uh, washing machines and things like that, to produce washing machines. It's a complicated piece of technology. It's a, it's a, it's a thing, it has electronics, it has mechanics, so on and so forth. The company that sells that, is an American company that produces that, has two of these imported for the commercial fair somewhere in, in June in, in Buenos Aires. They sell one of them, to a company that works in the south of Argentina, in Tierra de Fuego. The, the, other com the second <coughs> robot, they can't sell it. Nobody wants to buy it. So it costs so expensive, and it's so complicated to re-export this uh, bloody thing, that they let it in Buenos Aires, and they give it to a company, saying, if you want to use it, just do it. It makes no sense for us to bring it back to the US. OK? OK. After six months, both robots, the one that was bought by the company in Tierra de Fuego and the one that was offered and that was in, in the outside Buenos Aires, fail. Both of them have, have a circuit problem. 
So they stop working at all. So the engineers are very, very unhappy. Except that the one that was in Tierra de Fuego was implemented by two engineers that came, that implemented, had wor two people working on them, four engineers locally, all the group, the producing groups were working around the robot and so on and so forth. So when it didn't work, they say, let's call John, who is somewhere in Denver, who produces this thing, and, and then they call. It. And so he says, you have a fax machine. Yes, I have. Can you draw the circuit? Yes, of course. Why do, you know, do they know how to draw the circuit? Because they were working together. They set up the circuit. They set up the machine. They knew what the questions were. So they knew what to look at. The other ones in Buenos Aires, they had no context. They just had the machine free, but nobody was giving them any advice of any type. And they had not the capacities locally to manage the thing. So they just put it under sea, <laughs> whereas the other one in Tierra de Fuego worked. OK. So the, the story is that you can't transfer the technology if you don't learn how to use it locally, if you don't have a practice of it. And it's the only message, really, that you can base upon uh, 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 an experience. Is that going to lead to disruptive technologies or whatever? You never know. You just simply don't know. The works that we know about are disruptive innovation and if it works and if you implement new, absolutely new technology that makes, uh, really disrupts completely the process of production, you can't know it in advance. You just don't know it in advance. Uh, voila. Do, do we have technological learning uh, experiences without success? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, we have an experience, an interesting one, in China, of a company that was very, very much promoted at some time by the local government that was doing, that was a provider for Intel. This was in Xiaoqing. The company was, uh, um, they were doing uh, si uh, artificial silicates that are used. And it was a state-owned enterprise. And they were, they were, they were, uh, they had quite good level of technical, of technical uh, uh, dominion of uh, the process. And they became really a provider of Intel. And it, it worked for more than 10 years. They grew out of a company that was producing bad TVs to a good provider for Intel with a white chamber production at the fourth floor and everything working perfect. And one day, Intel decided to change its providers. Not because it was a bad provider. They didn't choose them. Not because they were a bad provider, but because they were too far away from the frontier. And, and what one of the things that Intel was trying at that moment was uh, I met the lady who, was, who took this decision, who was the head of, head of uh, outsourcing in Hong Kong office. And she said, I have 110 providers in the region of Guangdong. And there's one that cost me the double of all the other. So I'm not going to maintain that provider. Just as simple as that. And when you are Intel, you can take this kind of decisions. If you're a normal company, you don't. <laughs> OK, so they stopped the provi to provide. So this company tried to sell its, its products to other people doing circuits and, and integrated microprocessors and things like that. And they were too far away from the market. And among other reasons, because they had only the experience of exchanging with this particular client. So this is one of the main reasons why you would have a, disrupt, uh, a disruption or, or, or a failure in the process of learning. Did I answer everything? Questions? Um, yes. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. And also thanks to my colleagues for their uh, contributions yeah um, I have a question which is related on um, okay basically we have studied that uh, 
the way you perform innovation, there is a, some sort of dichotomy be between uh, disruptive innovation and just um, incremental innovation. And that is the outcome of a series of combination, which are either you perform basic research, applied research, the way you are financed, uh, which is through the bank system or we, uh, through the financial sector, and also the way you um, your em employers develop within the firm. So if you have uh, an internal, um, some sort of progression, or if you get uh, the people you need from the external labor market. And so we basically have this uh, schematic difference between um, applied uh, research, internal labor market, and a bank way to finance it leads to incremental innovation. And we generally, we are generally told that this is typical from a German firm or a Japanese firm, while this um, disruptive innovation, it's more the American firm and it comes from a basic research, um, external labor market and uh, financial uh, ways to, to, um, to finance uh, this process. So I was wondering whether this, first of all, if you agree with this, um, uh, way to categorize the way uh, firms, firms and, and the national systems can um, innovate and if China is somehow going anywhere between these two or if it is just too big to have a specific identity and it will just uh, follow its own path. Um, just thanks. My next question, if you don't mind, I have a small intro to that question. Uh, let's say, um, yes, yeah, sm small but interesting. Um, uh, <laughs> let's say, like, uh, in some point in time, uh, China and um, Chinese uh, producers were very famous for its, uh, um, softly speaking, borrowing ideas and coping ideas. Um, um, I have one, one very interesting uh, a new uh, case study and I will uh, talk about, um, do you know this electric board? It have a lot, of, a lot of names, but it's just like a skateboard, but with the um, with engine inside. So you just, it's kind of a uh, short distance vehicle, we can also call it, uh, they have few wheels, one wheel, or it can be different. Um, and now it's booming, it's very successful in some uh, specific markets. Um, and if you would have the idea to track who is the first, like, original one, who who is creator, who innovator, um, it, it is hard, it is tough question. Uh, you will go probably to uh, Alibaba and <laughs> search there and you will find uh, at least uh, 300 different produ uh, producers and different kinds of, uh, of this stuff. And if you will look really for original one, you will not find. And the answer would be something like all of them come up in, um, in one time somewhere or so. so there, there is no innovator as as we know on on our Western way of thinking. Um, but if you trace uh, further and you will look uh, who is this producers, um, they actually most of them located in one specific uh, in one area in China, uh, not very big city, but it's like a cluster. So actually, they are from one cluster mostly, and. Uh, the researcher was uh, speaking to them and asking, well, maybe you can say who was the first one, like who, who, who created this idea. And what they explained is that actually it's like uh, this idea is a, a product of their um, traditional way of cooperation with different, uh, different small firms in this cluster. So actually how it happened, it's uh, um, Friday evening, they're drinking together, talking, 
and they were thinking, oh, it will be fun to come up with new product. It will be maybe we can combine you and you and you. And then, and then, uh, then they said in, and then one morning um, after Hanover, you uh, have this. Wow, we can really do this. And they, they, they were starting like combining uh, uh, electric stuff, mechanic stuff, and uh, skateboard. So uh, in the end, it's. Uh, th um, it results in very good, successful product. Uh, yeah, very, very interesting one. Uh, w one more sentence, but um, uh, and then if you still continue asking these guys, but still, can you come up with one guy who really have this, you know, the first sparkle of this idea? And it was one guy, and then you uh, found him in US not in China, um, the Chinese guy, but he went to US and then you ask why? And he said because, because um, here you can protect your, your ideas. So my question is about uh, sources of technologies. You were talking about it. Can you, um, can you tell more about how in China the patent system is working, how, how protection of intellectual property is working, and how, how it impacts this uh, techno uh, technological learning and uh, innovation system as it is. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, more than a question, it is kind of confusing. So here it goes. Um, First thing, you talked about technological learning, right? And you talked about firms. My question is like, now we are in a world where we are seeing not firms who do incremental uh, learning, firms who are born global, as uh, we have this paper from Haldin that he talks about these firms from the very first day, they have the idea to become global. They are, they are not limited to incremental developments and then to go into a, the global market. How does learning work for these firms? And another question is uh, for now, uh, when we talk about innovation, uh, now we are in a world that's post industrial economy. Uh, we, are, we have new kinds of markets, especially after, uh, after internet, uh, like we are into the internet era. What, is, what kind of industries we are going to have? Like we said that in in developed economies, we will have more service uh, kind of service kind of firm, and in developing economies, we will have still more manufacturing-based industry. Where is China going to go with it? Because it is somewhere in the middle. Because China is spending a lot uh, compared to other developing countries into R and D, like 0.1 percent in Indonesia, but say 1.5 percent in China of their GDP, of course, uh, but still less than Finland or other countries. So. Where, where is the line for China? Thank you. It's 1.97 in 2012 in China. No 0 0.5. 2012 is 1.97% of GDP, R&D investment in 1.27. Okay. Not bad. That means more than, uh, he did the statistics, it is more, more than 140 million euros. More than 170 million, billion euros. Um, uh, can, I, can I begin with a more fundamental uh, difference between disruptive, I'll do it by order, no? disruptive and non-disruptive incremental. Uh, if I go back to my classics, um, the, um, it was always a matter of discussion in the literature on economics of innovation, what is a disruptive innovation? And, and probably the most interesting interpretation was you have a difference between uh, what, uh, what's his name? Uh, called it architectural innovations and non-architectural innovations. That is, innovations that modify not the market or the productive system, but that modify 
the way you gather the resources, the type of resources that you bring in in your specific process. Uh, the some, some technologies that when you implement them, they don't use the same kind of knowledge, they don't same use the same kind of material, they modify also the way you, 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 you develop them on ta in time and so on. So there's a, a large difference between one and the other. And there, there's nothing porous between two architectural innovations, it's different companies, end of story. Now, innovations that are incremental can become disruptive if the market disrupts or if the level of investment that you have had and the level of partnerships and the level of uh, external linkages, the one that were brought in by your, your colleagues here, uh, are so strong that they do really modify the way you interact with your environment. I would say that what defines the difference between the two is not so much a question of definition, it's a, it's a question of degree. So it's a, it's a higher degree. I would, I would rather say that it's, it's for matters of, uh, matters of uh, analysis that we say that they are incremental or disruptive because most companies do incremental innovation. And then, give you, I'll give you an example. Automobile companies, the big ones, they invest a lot in R&D, and they mostly ask for incremental innovations. There's one part that is really fundamental for them. It's not the electronics and all the bullshit that we pay hard. It's, it's, it's really the machine, the engine itself, the motor itself. And Renault found out after 10 years of asking shorter delays and quicker innovation and all that, that they had absolutely no innovation into their engines anymore. <coughs> the same engine you had in the absolutely electronic, fantastic car today is the same engine you had 15 years ago. Exactly. There's nothing changed. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So. What happened? So they were absolutely astonished to find out by looking behind what happens and seeing on time and, and finding out that they had no more innovation at all in the engines. So they began scratching around and they said, well, it's very easy. If you ask us an innovation every two years, we're not going to do any change on an engine because we need at least seven to eight to nine years to introduce a change in an engine. As simple as that. So, so you want shorter delays? Forget it. You're not going to have innovation. You're going to have packaging. That's fantastic. More electronics. You can have people pay more for that. You maybe have a growth of your market. You will not have innovation. There's, so then the company makes a choice. It's a strategic choice. Do you want to have people pay more for the same plastic bottle, or you want to have something else than a plastic bottle? But it's a choice. It's it's it. Um, does R and D plays a, an essential role in that? I mean, if you don't have the R and D, you won't have this 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 growth because at some point you need to disconnect your your um, everyday production system with the capacity to think a little bit of of, of what you are going to do. But if you are if you are copying, go back there. If you are copying a server that already exists, used by Cisco, and you are Huawei, and you copy the server, you need a lot of people copying the, the, the server. You don't, you, don't, you, don't need, you don't need to do on the production things. You just need to have a lot of people do the engineering around, around your, your machine. So the same thing happens for copying or for deciding if you want to go on your growth to something that maybe will be disruptive. On the first hand, before, before it happens, you will never be able to say it's going to be disruptive or not. Something similar happens with the new technologies that came out of nowhere. For example, internet and all that. It was not out of nowhere. It was from Palo Alto. It was from a government laboratory. All the small companies and, and, and Silicon Valley, and all that they invented nothing. They just adopted the technology that was in Palo Alto just next corner in Stanford. It was not somewhere else in the world. 
It was in Stanford. It was done by engineers that were based in Stanford, paid by the government. All of them were university teachers and university engineers. They went out of that. Some of them created companies. Their kids created companies, knowing what dad was doing. Dad was Tog Engelbart or someone of, out of his team. We know the names of the story, exactly. One by one. Apple documented that. So it's not out of nowhere. It's out of a research government lab. And, and something similar happens to all the disruptive technology. Uh, Achille Adeli studied, for example, the R&D in pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies long ago have stopped to do uh, research for, for, for new molecules. They just do packaging. Most of the companies, very, very few companies, really work on, 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 on specific molecules. And what happens is that with one molecule, they can pay for all the other things they invest, just with having one. That's why the battle of, on one product usually is, is so crucial for them. And it's and su such, such a thing. But it's, it's not disruptive. Really, technology is coming from outside the company. It's something that is very rare and very located to a specific research activity, to a specific research group, to a specific investment, usually done by the government, who is the only one who can pay for this. Because it does not really pay for that. It really pays for the salaries of the people who do it, which is the difference. They just pay for my salary. They don't pay for anything else. Um, the, the story about the protection of, uh, of innovations in China that you were saying with the electric board. I didn't know this thing about the electric boards. I have to. Yeah. It's beautiful. One of the mysteries of your story of the introduction, which is nice, is uh, they all come from the same cluster. That happens everywhere in China. There's, uh, this because, but it's, a, it's, an <laughs> it's an old tradition. Uh, we have clusters uh, by, by industrial activity everywhere in the country. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's probably one of the useful things, one of the things that fueled the rapidity of the, of the growth of uh, industry in, in China in the between mid-80s and mid-2000, let's say, more or less. This absolutely fantastic uh, growth. Um, so, so all clothes come from the same place. So all faucets now come, na I don't know, 60% of the, f f uh, the taps, water taps and faucets come from a city called Chueco which is a small city with 400 small companies. Some, some 10, or four, 10 to 30 out of these companies grew considerably. We, we visited them in 2000 and we visited them in 2010. And, and it was very funny because they, the, the basically they were doing the same thing except that there were less companies and more big ones. But they were more or less the same, doing more or less the same thing working on this scheme of producing for some client, the client giving them blueprints and growing, so on and so forth. And this kind of cluster-based cities is, is really a model that has been, you can find everywhere you know, in, in all China. So it's not at all rare that you find 300 companies at the same place. What I was arguing in this article that you had is that they're not Marshall, Marshallian types of clusters. They're not just... Um, uh, coordinated. They're not coordinated at all. Some of them have um, family members that have invested also uh, your cousin or your brother or someone else who also invests in another company and has another company. But they don't really cooperate between them. They just do the same business. So since all the buyers go to buy for the same product, so they are all located in the good place, so th it helps them. I mean, it's the, the idea is that it's sort of externality of being all together in the same place doing the same time kind of production. But it's not really cooperation between them. Um, the number one that invents a thing is in, in the US, no? And he, he wants, and he stays in the US because he wants protection. And he doesn't get it when he goes in China because of <laughs> the Chinese system of, of patenting is changing now. Part, part of it is because they had so many problems with the with the US and with um, World uh, Trade uh, um, yeah, Organization, because they became members of the World Trade Organization. So WTO t told them that they have to check a little bit, control a bit what happens. Uh, 
Uh, as far as I know, the biggest scandals that happened in China was of companies that were not paying for this kind of property rights and so on and so forth. But I think property rights, rights has nothing to do with innovation or industrial growth. Absolutely nothing. And China is a good example of that. Uh, n nobody gave a dime on how it's going to be protected, your, your, your inventions, etc., in China. And everybody was copying everybody. Uh, and so it, it really, they, it was never a, a, a matter of consideration. When they, the first judges that were trained to do um, really, um, you know, this kind of filing uh, complaints on copying and all that, who did that, who went to the to the foreign countries, came back, created cabinets. In fact, it was to protect uh, either imports in China or exports towards towards uh, uh, for foreign clients, not for Chinese clients. So, so that's that's the, uh, a lot of a lot of the the people working in the legal system that uh, specialize in that do it for the for foreign companies that want to have legal issues with uh, Chinese producers. But it's, it's very, very limited. It can be a very juicy market. What happens is that patents is a market by itself, independently of what you protect. And, and, and that's why the Japanese have a different management of the market than the Koreans have a different, um, and so on and so forth. And it be, it's still not an interesting market in China. It's probably going to happen, but it's still not one. There's a fantastic book on the origin of the patent system and its use in, in the US, written by Jeff Boker. It's called Science on the Run. It's, it's a, a book on the story of Schlumberger. Schlumberger is the biggest uh, prospect, uh, oil prospecting company. It's not a very big company. It's a very technically high level company, but it's not a very big one. It was created by two brothers, Schlumberger, two Alsatian engineers, geological engineers. And when they went to the US, they found oil. It was the rush for the uh, petroleum in the, in the US at the beginning of the 20th century, end of 19th, beginning of 20th century. And then they invented the system to detect uh, petroleum, which was not the best one, but it's the one that dominated the market very quickly. Uh, in part because they had a strategy for protecting their invention. And by protecting their invention, they were diffusing it. But they were, every time somebody was selling something else, or another technology, or selling the same without saying it was them, they were filing a process to these guys. They were going to the tribunals. Every single time they were filing something. What they mainly did in the US was not to diffuse by selling, but by attacking those who were copying them, or those who pretended to have a different technology than they. they saying that they are the only ones who detect petroleum, the other ones don't know how to do it. <laughs> That's how, I mean, but to enter into this use of the legal system is by itself an experiment or an experience. That, I mean, that, okay. um, Companies are born global. You are grown, born global. I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> all of you. <laughs> you have computers, you have tabs, <laughs> phones, and all that. So it's not very different, <laughs> except that, that you see it global. That's all. I mean, I, this, uh, I had a, in, an interesting experience when I went to, to Silicon Valley. And that was when Jeff Walker, the, the guy who wrote this book, who was director of the Center of uh, Technologies at Santa Clara University, which is the only university based uh, in San Jose, the city, the heart of, of Silicon Valley. They have a small, it's a very old university that belongs to the Jesuits, uh, Catholic University. So they have a small center that they were called the Science Technology Society Center. And they had, um, organizing meetings with uh, engineers and, and business people uh, coming uh, around the world, doing training sessions, conferences to exchange, and so on. A large quantity of these, if not most of them, were uh, of the foreign, of the foreign one engineers or, or, or 
people coming, business people coming, were coming from India. A large, large quantity of them. Most of them with a training in the US, someplace, somewhere, in some, some matter. And most of them already, already owners of five to six companies. And what was interesting was that they had um, absolutely no difficulty in thinking either in being a productive company or a service company. They were not specializing in any kind of, because there was this idea that the Indians, they are very good in the service in, L, in informatics and so on, and, 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 that, and then that the Chinese more on the manufacturing thing. Well, in fact, the people that were really uh, exchanging internationally on the creation of tech-based companies, they had no difficulty in thinking of themselves as being one day a product, pro producing, I mean, with an industrial base, and another day thinking of themselves as being selling services or tech services around, around a thing. Uh, I think there's, n there's nothing uh, written in advance in the, in, the, in, the strategy, in the strategy that you will have. There's no really, there's no really difference in being service or, or industry. The last innovation survey I, I, I did was in Lebanon. And, and we did, uh, we found out, first of all, we found out that, contrary to what everybody said, that they were doing a lot of R&D, which was astonishing. Lebanon is war thing. Well, there's at least $120 million invested in R&D in, in small companies, in industrial companies, in a country that has, or that had at that time, less than 4, 4 million inhabitants, and, and, and something like 8,000 companies. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's very small. And interestingly, everybody says Lebanon is a service-oriented economy because it's 60 or 70 percent of its GDP is services. When, when, you, when you were digging on what the kind of uh, new companies, startups and companies doing uh, uh, new investments in technology were doing, a lot of them were doing services that were adaptation or indigenation, making the indigenous version of, a, of a, something that already exists elsewhere. And a lot of these companies were also based or quickly, very quickly, in relation with the manufacturing facility. So the, interestingly enough, if you don't have the, I would, I would suggest, but I'm not an industrial economist, I would suggest that services, in particular when they are related to industry, are efficient when they are connected to the manufacturing capaci capacities. If you disconnect it completely, it doesn't work. Another question? Yes. Hi. So I'm um, I'm one of the students not from the innovation group. So I haven't really studied these kind of things before. Um, but I thought it was interesting. You were talking about the idea of these disruptive innovations and how there's not really a whole lot of way to predict where they come from or what kind of innovations will be like that. Um, so I guess I was wondering, what, how do we think about the role for radical change in large, diffuse institutions? Um, so talking about there's like a region of China where everyone makes sink faucets. What, how do we think about what could change that? And I guess sort of where, I, where the two things that really originally got me thinking about this topic is first the COP21 going on and this idea of what is it that could take that could cause a large change within industry and within the private economy besides governments coming in from the outside to really make a significant change on that front um, and the other little bit more of a stretch but sort of what i was thinking is the idea of the prof economics profession itself talking about um, there's sort of uh, a hierarchy and you have very well defined institutions and ideas that have taken over. Um, it's sort of the something we talk about quite a bit in this program, but the idea of a, a mainstream of knowledge and a, a whole lot of things that aren't easily able to change that. So I was wondering just what this sort of literature has to say about conceptualizing how we think about those kind of changes. Okay, so the last question, it is. 
mainstream of knowledge, yeah. In economics? Yeah. It's a long time I have not read an economic text anymore. <laughs> I'm not doing economics anyway. Uh, I would, uh, if, if I come back to the initial steps I was mentioning, the initial things, uh, intuitions that we tried to document, which came up really out of the field work, was that uh, the story about um, a cumulative process over time uh, that brings you in some sort of path of development and then you are stuck in that. And it's very difficult to get out of that. And I, I, would, s I would say that all these authors that were mentioned in the slide by, uh, by uh, sorry, I forgot your name, Christopher. by Christopher, was all of these people uh, the three on the three columns that were on the right, of the, uh, uh, all of them begin up from there. I mean, their, their, their question is, how much institutions favor or not this thing? Uh, Nelson, in one of his last papers, that was probably uh, 2005, 2006 in research policy, uh, Richard Nelson was, was, uh, was uh, taking a very old idea uh, that, um, in fact, institutions can be supportive to change in some particular cases. But, they, he did, th but then he said, it's a good idea, but I really don't know what are the cases where it is supportive. Pierre Gourou, who was a geographer, a French geographer uh, in the 20s, who was colonial uh, manager, con colonial administrator in, in Vietnam, in Indochina, in, and who was probably one of the best geographers in, in France, had a very, uh, very detailed analysis of the distribution of, um, of uh, production of villages in the coast of, of Vietnam of all the coast of Vietnam. And he was saying that the intensity of production of, the, of these regions is well far beyond what a uh, normal agriculture engineer at that time would predict for these areas. And you had a density of population that was the highest in the world at that time in this, in this, in this region, the coastal region of Vietnam. And you had, at that same time, uh, a very highly uh, structured and organized system of villages and, and, and markets that distributed over the territory with very high densities of population, a lot of middle towns that were industrial towns. And you find something similar that, that begins to happen in, in the post-revolutionary post China, when basically in the after the, the economic of opening, where all the coastal line of, of China begins to grow with a sort of interconnected markets, small intermediate uh, villages, and so on. Why do I go to, towards this thing? Because part, part of this story about institution is very much forgetting the location of the institutions. And I think it has a lot to do with that. You don't manage the same way coastal zones, uh, cities, villages, um, agricultural areas, and so on. And uh, the pedigree of the, of the institutions comes very much from your environment, not so much from, from the pattern of organization. This is very classical things. I mean, Wittfogel was talking about the hydraulic, uh, hydraulic uh, bureaucracies. Uh, you have the Timothy Mitchell paper. I think probably the most interesting um, book on this issue, one of the most interesting on this issue is probably Timothy Mitchell uh, on, the, on the oil uh, economy, well, where he said car it's called carbon democracy. Uh, where he, he, Timothy Mitchell argues that when you had the Industrial Revolution, you were basing it on carbon, which is uh, by nature involving a lot of uh, institutions, a lot of people. You need to have syndicates, you need to have workers organized, you need to have, because the management of the mines, the management of the transfer of the carbon, the whole economy you are organizing is very much distributed with a lot of intermediate power, power uh, units and so on. 
And he says, on the contrary, when you switch to oil, you don't need all these people. It's very easy to extract. It's very easy to transport. You need very few people to manage the thing. You're, you're, the, the way you are using, exploiting the, the, the energy is much easier in terms of it needs less energy to exploit the energy. It needs less institution to exploit the, 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 the oil as, as a source of energy. It's an interesting idea. There's the same idea as, uh, I forget his name, a specialist in, of China, who, a historian of China who wrote uh, a book on, on the same argument, saying that if it had not been from the colonial uh, policies of, uh, of the Europeans in China, I mean, if China had not had the recess of the 19th century and it would have grown normally, it would have grown probably as England, something similar on the size of, uh, of England because it was based mainly on the same resource, which was carbon. And it's still based on the same resource, which is carbon. And basically, you had to have not a democracy, but a sort of distributed power relations when you are, you, when you are on carbon. It's a complicated argument. It's a complex argument because you are talking about the whole of a society with its, the whole of its institutions. The point I want to, to raise is that uh, you, you don't change radically an institution. You, you, uh, you, you make it slip on the side. You, you make it function differently on the margins. And it ends up finding out its margins work better than the heartland.